I find myself wondering about humanity. Their attitude to my sister's gift is so strange. Why do they fear the sunless lands? It is as natural to die as it is to be born. But they fear her. They dread her. Feebly they attempt to placate her. They do not love her. Many thousands of years ago, I heard a song in a dream, a mortal song, that celebrated her gift, and still remember it. Death is before me today, like the recovery of a sick man, like going forth into a garden after sickness. Death is before me today, like the odor of myrrh, like sitting under a sail in a good wind. Death is before me today, like the course of a stream, like the return of a man from the war galley to his house. Death is before me today, like the home that a man longs to see after years spent as a captive. That poet understood her gifts. She has a function to perform, even as do I. The endless have their responsibilities. I have responsibilities. Of all the family, we are the closest. I walk by her side, and the darkness lifts from my soul. I walk with her and I hear the gentle beating of mighty wings. Death is indeed before us on this episode with the gentle beating of mighty wings. That was from the Sandman audiobook. Unless you're listening on YouTube and they deleted it as they have been doing recently with many of my start intro clips. Regardless, death is before us. In the scene, you hear the ethereal words of the Dream King, Morpheus, narrated by James McAvoy. He is describing his sister, Death. I agree that we must stop running from her. The cosmic womb is also the cosmic tomb. And as the Gospel of Philip states, Light and darkness, life and death, right and left, are brothers of one another. They are inseparable. Because of this, neither are the good good, nor evil evil, nor is life life, nor death death. For this reason, each one will dissolve into its earliest origin. But those who are exalted above the world are indissoluble, eternal. Eternity isn't a long time. Eternity has nothing to do with time. Eternity is that dimension of here and now, which thinking in time cuts out. This, this is, is this. this is mine. If, if you don't get it here, you won't get it anywhere. And the experience of eternity right here and now is the function of life. Thus, with the gentle beating of mighty wings, we deal now with death's chief incarnation in modern times, Santa Muerte. It's a Halloween special, and you'll be haunted into enlightenment in so many ways. But you're already dead, as you see reality beyond its four-dimensional limitations, and thus are reborn. While the rest of the meat sacks are also dead, but in a different way, because, as the Gnostics also contended, death and ignorance are one and the same. In the Sandman, Death and Morpheus, or Dream, are the closest siblings of the gods above gods, the Endless. And it makes sense to you, because you know Dream Time is true life and returning. And, as the movie The Fountain says, Death is the road to awe. Down through the centuries, the notion that life is wrapped in a dream has been a pervasive theme of philosophers and poets. So doesn't it make sense that death too would be wrapped in dream? That after death your conscious life would continue? I mean, you know, if you can wake up, you should. Because, you know, someday, you know, you won't be able to. So just, um, but it's easy. You know, just, just wake up. 
Welcome to Aeon Bite. Welcome to the machine, my son, and the means to escape it. Welcome to that dream of you, that distant ship smoke on the horizon. We don't take prisoners but liberate them. We are not the final authority on anything, but hope to be an endless possibility for everything. We're choosing ecstasy over entertainment in this age of Hermes because we restore death and life to their holy source with our myth, magic, and meaning. As always, I, Miguel Connor, am honored to be your host and pompadus of Gnosis, honored by your company and support, as together we ride with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. It's like God's vagina. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? To get acquainted with Santa Muerte, we have the honor and pleasure of being joined at the Virtual Alexandria by Dr. Andrew Chestnut, author of the seminal book, Devoted to Death. Santa Muerte, the Skeleton Saint. Mind-blowing interview, oh you of the broken places. We could only do a bit over an hour due to scheduling issues and a few tech archons on my side. This means everyone will get the full deep chill. However, as a bonus for AB Prime members, patrons at Patreon, and Red Circle subscribers, I'll include a past interview with Tracy Rollins on her own book on Santa Muerte. As with Andrew, we'll cover the history and theology of the Death Goddess. Yet Tracy gives us a feminine and devotee angle, as well as a more general conversation on magic, saints, and the Death Deity across history. As another bonus, I'll include an excerpt with Earl Lee on his book, from the bodies of the gods, where he argues that there has been a death cult for millennia in Western culture, shamanistic and entheogen using, and how it has shaped most of our civilization. Almost three hours of content that will get you fully understanding Santa Muerte and embracing death for a life of awe and dream time doesn't get better than this in this season of the witch it's halloween and as much fun as it is it can also be very dangerous you see with all you kids running around wearing dark clothing and monster and devil masks that cover your whole face you all run into a serious risk of becoming devil worshippers or even buddhists as you've noticed the gnostics had various views of death Yet in all of them, they neither feared nor rejected her. In the text, on the origins of the world, death is an archon that Yaldibaldi creates when his son, Sabaoth, rebels against him and joins Sophia in the Eighth Sphere. The archon death is female and acts like Pandora, giving birth from her, well, box, Archons who manifest all the calamities of humanity, like pain, envy, jealousy, sadness, wrath, and the show The Big Bang Theory. In eternity, where there is no time, nothing can grow, nothing can become. So death created time to grow the things that it would kill. And you are reborn but into the same life. Beyond the arc on death, Sophia herself has a shadow side that makes her akin to Santa Muerte. Both are mercenary savior deities who enjoy a trick or two on creation, as you will see. Sophia's aspect of Akamoth is called the Wisdom of Death. Sophia is known as the Queen of Hades in the Gospel of the Egyptians. In other writings, she is referred to as the mother of the angels, sometimes the barren one or the whore. Sophia's fallen and Luciferian, our sister and greatest desire as we linger here in the Black Iron Prison. I don't want to interrupt. I'll just get started on the apocalypse. 
So embrace death as you embrace life. Integrate them beyond this four-dimensional simulation. As the Gospel of Philip says too, when Eve was part of Adam, there was no death. Only when Eve was separated did death come into the universe. Eve, or life in Hebrew, must be integrated for death to leave, or more like be integrated as well. As I've said before on this show, the primal root of the mind killer that is fear comes from our wanting to control life, wanting not to die, rejecting death. From an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense, but from a spiritual off-worlder stance, from a place of ultimate freedom, it makes no sense. We are not in control of life, never have been, and neither are we in control of death. It's the wanting. Huh? The Buddhist will tell you, all life is pain. Pain comes from always wanting things. Death is everywhere as is life, and the best we can do is, yes, incorporate both into our psyches and let our higher purpose take us to where we were meant to be, which is always high above the spikes of the black iron prison, lifted with the force and sound of mighty wings. Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood, an afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it? Perhaps four or five times more? Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20. And yet it all seems limitless. This all reminds me of a beautiful poem by Mary Elizabeth Fry. It goes, Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there, I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the softly falling snow. I am the gentle showers of rain. I am the fields of ripening grain. I am in the morning hush. I am in the graceful rush of beautiful birds in circling flight. I am the starshine of the night. I am in the flowers that bloom. I am in a quiet room. I am in the birds that sing. I am in each lovely thing. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. And death shall have no dominion led us to our interview with Andrew, and then powerful bonuses on this Halloween special. I didn't think it would end this way. End? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path. One that we almost take. The grey rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. And then you see it. What? And Elf? See what? White shores. And beyond. The far green country. A swift sunrise. Oh. That isn't so bad. No. No, it isn't. This is the Aeon Bite interview, and with us we have the pleasure and the honor of having Dr. Andrew Chestnut to discuss a topic I like and I really like, and uh a figure that is, I feel, very important today based on his excellent book, Devoted to Death, Santa Muerte, The Skeleton Saint. Andrew, thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks so much for the invitation, Miguel. Uh, pleasure is all ours. And always a pleasure, too. We've got the moon dog, Vance Sachi. Vance, how are you doing? 
I'm fine this morning uh, out here in sunny California, and I'm counting on you guys not to let me beat a dead horse on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm back here in sunny Virginia. You have no monopoly on the sun there. <laughs> All right. We have Send some, some rain though. here. We have some <laughs> sun here in Illinois right now. It's not too late. It's not too late. Well, awesome. Awesome. And uh, well, Andrew, why don't we talk about how you became interested in Santa Muerte? I believe it was, uh, according to your book, a uh, intersection between being kind of uh, dissatisfied with another goddess and seeing some news footage, right? Exactly. Um, I am a specialist in the Latin American religious landscape. And for my third book project, I wanted to do something monumental. And so I was two years into a book project on the Virgin of Guadalupe, who is not only the matron saint of Mexico, but actually the matron saint of the entire Americas from Canada down to Chile. And I was about two years into that and was kind of bored, wasn't finding, as you can imagine, there's been a lot written on her. Um, since she really is the most important advocation of the Virgin Mary in the Catholic world. And I just wasn't really finding a unique angle. And of course, you know, as an academic, you want to look, you want to do something new, look for unique angles. And in that context of kind of research malaise, in March of 2009, I'm on my um, antiquated laptop and I see the news that the Mexican army had moved into the border with both Texas and California and had bulldozed and backhoed some 40 Santa Muerte altars and shrines. And I've been going to Mexico since 1983. My ex-wife is from Mexico City. My current wife is from the great state of Michoacan. Um, and so I knew about Santa Muerte, but I had no idea when I first saw that news why then President Mexican President Calderon had had you know decided to send in the army to bulldoze um, this Mexican folk saint. And uh, I did a quick Google search and quickly discovered that uh, the Calderon administration at the time had fingered Santa Muerte as kind of the religious enemy number one, the patron saint of narcos, of cartels, right. with whom he had just launched a major offensive uh, when he became president in, in 2009. So uh, I found that really intriguing, did a quick Google search, saw that the... Um, that there was minimal academic literature in Spanish um, produced by Mexican academics, even less in English. There, there really was nothing in 2009 in English. And so I consulted with uh, colleagues, friends, family, and within a few weeks decided, okay, at least temporarily, I'm going to turn my back on <laughs> Guadalupe and uh, and delve into this uh, this interesting new religious movement of Santa Muerte with the aim of of producing the first book in English, um, and that I did. So, Devoted to Death was first published in 2012 by Oxford University Press, and the second edition came out in 2017. And so that that really was the catalyst for what has now been what 12 years of research of Santa Muerte. Um, that offensive against her. And, there, and let me say, there has been no other such massive offensive in which the Mexican army has been sent in to, to raise her altars and shrines. I know, religious persecution right underneath our nose. <laughs> yeah, interestingly, um, the two countries, the, the, the region on, on the planet that has the greatest degree of religious liberty is the Americas. But the two countries with the least degree of freedom of worship, interestingly, are Cuba, of course, because the legacy right. of how many years of dictatorship are we on, 62 or something, uh, and Mexico. And in Mexico, it's, 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 it's the influence, the still very great political influence of the Catholic Church. Mexico has the second largest Catholic population on the planet after Brazil. Uh, still about 77% of Mexicans claim to be Catholic. And so if there has been, if, if Santa Muerte has been unable to be uh, legally recognized as a religious association in Mexico, it's due to the strong influence of the Catholic Church there. 
Wow. Yeah, and it's ironic. I, I know I lived in Mexico for seven years, and I know that the Constitution, I think, banned the Catholic Church because of the friction in the old days trying to get away. But, you know, it's kind of one of those things, you know, Mexico, just because it's a law. People are <laughs> right. Turn their heads. right, exactly. I mean, in the aftermath of the of the 1920 rev- revolution, right. there's some radical anti-clerical legislation. You're you're exactly right. But but the clock, I mean, the pendulum has swung the other way since the 1990s or so. And and the Catholic Church has reclaimed a lot of the political influence that had lost during the preceding decades. Yeah, and despite that, Andrew. Uh, it's interesting because as you write and you contend and obviously show data, she is now more popular than all Mexican saints except St. Jude, the patron saint of lost causes, and uh, La Flaca, as she's known, or Nuestra Madrina, is more popular than I, than the Virgin Mary. With I think, don't you say there's about 12 million devotees? Yeah, yeah, I don't I don't think I would go that far and say that she's more popular than than the Virgin Guadalupe. Mm-hmm. Um I mean if if you go to botanicas, um the shops that sell that sell kind of esoteric religious articles in Mexico, there's no doubt. I mean, she's she's the number one seller and has been for the last decade at least. Um but yeah, I'm not going to go so far to say that she's more more popular than uh, the Virgin Guadalupe, who who really is, you know, not only a constituent part of of Mexican Catholicism, but also Mexican identity. And so, for example, folks who who convert to Protestantism, it's a big deal, you know, no longer having allegiance to to the Queen of Mexico. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. In just twenty years of being public. Santa Muerte has grown so uh, exponentially that, you know, she's one of the three great religious figures today on the Mexican religious landscape, along with Guadalupe. And you may mentioned um, the other um, St. Jude, the patron of lost causes. So, yeah, she's one of the big three there. Yeah, it's incredible how much she's uh, she's grown and everything else. Uh... And for the audience, yeah, if you ever get a chance, I, I always promote go see, go visit Fatima in uh, in Portugal. That's uh-huh. where I'm from. I've, but I've also been, the oh, you have it's I've been there twice. Beautiful. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's beautiful. that's fantastic too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and visiting uh, Lady of Guadalupe is also an incredible experience. But uh, it is, I think, it's the most visited Marian shrine in the world. Maybe an average of six or seven million wow. visitors annually. Incredible, incredible. And uh, despite all of this, she, Santa Muerte, has been sensationalized as a narco goddess. And of course, uh, in your book, and I've seen interviews, this has been uh, promoted by, uh, well, really great shows like True Detective, Breaking Bad, uh, Dexter, and so forth. But it's imp- I think it's important early on to establish that she is much more than that, right? She has a very broad appeal. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's kind of the overarching thrust of my book, too, is to dispel this stereotype that, you know, she's really nothing but a narco saint, um, as as, you know, various Mexican administrations has alleged. Um, no doubt. And I, I have an entire chapter of the black candle. No doubt. One of her multiple roles is as protectress of um, not all cartel members, but but of some narcos, there's no doubt that that is an important role that she plays. But, you know, the great majority of these estimated 12 million devotees are not narcos. And so, yeah, the misrepresentation, the mischaracterization of her uh, on both sides of the border, it's not only here in the United States, not only in Hollywood, but also in Mexican film and TV, uh, is, you know, 90, 90, 95 percent of the coverage of her is as this a uh, satanic narco saint doing the spiritual bidding of um of murderous cartel members so yeah that's one of the big points of my book is yes she is that 
but that's only <laughs> one of her roles. She's also an important curandera, our, our faith healer. She's an agent of prosperity. Many sp small businesses in Mexico who don't even sell her paraphernalia will have a small um, altar in their store to help prosper their business. She is a... Um, she is a supernatural lawyer or attorney as well, um, symbolized by her color green. So she's she's a multifaceted multitasker. Yeah, indeed. Like uh, like Isis was in Greco-Roman times. She just exactly. expanded to be a goddess of all. And uh, even as you write, Andrew, uh, you talk about uh, your nephew is a prison guard in Mexico. And he says, yes, you know, the... The, the people trapped there or incarcerated might be devotees, but I think, what, 20% of the workers he told you are devotees too? Even yeah, the law, 20, law yeah, enforcement. He, is, exactly. He told me about a quarter of his fellow prison guards are also devotees. And so that led me to, to say in my book, Devoted to Death, that, that she really is the matron saint of the Mexican penal system, because it's not only the inmates themselves, it's the guards, and maybe some of <laughs> even the, the so, social workers and psychologists, the whole penal system. In fact, I'm going to expand that. Uh, I have another uh, recent article with my with my research partner, Dr. Kate Kingsbury from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, who's also a leading scholar of Santa Muerte, in which we show that, you know, Santa Muerte I mean, more than the narco saint is actually the matron saint of the Mexican drug war writ large in that she also has a robust following among Mexican law enforcement um, on all levels, but particularly among those who bear the brunt, uh, who take the greatest hits and casualties in the Mexican drug wars. And that would be local police, municipal police officers. And so she, you know, she has a, a robust following among uh, Mexican law law enforcement as well. So yeah, it's not only the narcos. Yeah, you you detail not just the research history and theology of Santa Muerte, but you also talk, you you talk to a lot of people, and some of the stories are just uh, jaw dropping. Like you write about this police officer Pedro Hernandez, who just came home from work, and this car came out with four gunmen, and he he grabbed his Santa Muerte medallion, and they. I think they shot him up like 600 times and he was able to get out of his car, go into his house with his wife. And then the, the assailant, the assassins came in and just said, vamonos. And they left him. And then he healed pretty well. And he was like, this is Santa Muerte protecting the police officer. Exactly. Exactly. That was, yeah, that was a unforgettable story. Uh, I happened to meet him at the um, temple of Santa Muerte Internacional which is the largest transnational organization of temples and shrines. Um, they have their headquarters in a gritty suburb called Tutitlan. It's the, the famous one a lot of folks have seen with a 75 foot giant um, um, fiberglass statue there. Um, I just happened to meet him there. And, and so, you know, he told me his whole story, which, as you said, was was first about protection. Death is protecting him from being killed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then and then incredible healing too. you know, very rapid healing as well. And that's one thing that really initially blew my mind when I came into the research research and these things are only revealed when you do in-depth interviews with devotees i had no idea that she was an important healer that so many people come to her for faith healing because at first who would imagine that people are supplicating death herself for healing right because right. we usually think of death as the grim reaper coming to end your life to blow your candle <laughs> out but no and a really important role is for asking her to uh you know, to slow down that hourglass of life, that iconic hourglass of life that she holds to give you a few more days, weeks, or years. Yeah, indeed. And uh, um, there's so many stories that Andrew writes about uh, for you in the audience. Again, they're, they're, they're jaw dropping, but you travel for this research. And I was thinking, well, uh, I wonder if you'd do it again, because you were in some pretty seedy places doing this research, right? Did you have any issues or resistance being a, a güero, a gringo? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, initially, I, I was very nervous because um, I started my 
I started my academic career as a Brazil specialist. And so almost all of my major research had been done in Brazil. And even though I told you I had these family connections to Mexico, I hadn't done any serious research in Mexico prior to embarking on Santa Muerte. Uh, and, and, you know, being a gringo or American researcher in Mexico can, can present challenges that, that it doesn't necessarily in Brazil and other places. And so at first I was thinking, well, gosh, you know, how are they going to receive me? I'm not a devotee and I'm not going to pretend to be a devotee or whatever. But it was amazing, Miguel. I mean, in all my years of research, I think I've only had one, one devotee refuse to talk to me. And that was just because they were in a hurry to go somewhere else. Right. And so um, in the beginning, a lot of times I would go, um, I would go with my wife, who again is from the um, western state of Michoacan which unfortunately has been one of the hardest hit states yeah, with the drug violence. That's where we had La Familia Michoacana cartel and then the Knights Templar cartel. She's from the state capital of Morelia. Anyway, so she would accompany me a lot and she would often, um, it seems that there's probably twice as many female devotees. And so she would focus on interviewing female devotees. So I think, you know, initially this kind of team of, you know, a Mexican and American uh, might have helped. But most importantly, I did a lot of my interviews at the most famous Santa Muerte uh, shrine in Tepito, the rough and tumble barrio, infamous barrio of Mexico City, where Doña uh, Enriqueta Romero uh, first started her shrine in early 2001. In fact, we're just on the eve of the 20. 20th anniversary of her founding her shrine. But I had, I, I met her, I had her blessing. So I could just interview whoever I wanted at her shrine uh, because folks knew I had their blessing. And so that, I mean, that really kind of gave me carte blanche. Okay, he's approved. He's got the approval from the godmother of the son of the cult of Santa Muerte. So that just really facilitated um, talking to folks. Yeah, interesting. You, you talked about Brazilian studies. I remember as a kid, my mom would take me to the yearly celebration of the Virgin Mary out of to the sea. But then my mom, of course, would wink at me and said, well, it's not it's the Virgin Mary, but it's actually the goddess. Uh, it's Yemanja. actually, yeah, it's actually Yemanja. <laughs> and right? we all knew it. The church knew it. The people, the Brazilians knew it, but nobody cared. It was fine having this fusion. No big it's deal. It's funny that you mentioned that because of my Brazil connection and because I spent a lot of time in Rio de Janeiro, where on New Year's New Year's Day, she has her, her festival of Yemanja. So my daughter's middle name is Yemanja. Oh, how cool. <laughs> good, good name. <laughs> and uh, just, yeah, we want to get into the origins. We might get into the origins with this, with this next question because there is some irony, but uh, how has the pandemic changed the devotion of, to Santa Muerte? Has it increased it? Has it changed her or the population? Um, um, yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, we don't have any hard data. And that's why I say like an estimated 12 million. That's my right. best guesstimate after 12 years of research. But unfortunately, you know, at this point, uh, Pew Foundation, Gallup, the major folks who do um, surveys have not done a systematic survey. So we can only kind of speculate and estimate. It is my impression and it makes sense that that um, devotion to her has done nothing but been on the uptick since the pandemic. And another, I mean, one of our most viral academic articles on Santa Muerte ever, again, with my uh, research par partner, Dr. Kate Kingsbury, was our, um, our article focusing on Santa Muerte as a, as a protectress and healer of, of COVID-19, because, you know, Mexico has been one of the hardest hit countries in the world. I think they're either third or fourth in deaths. And so um, a lot of folks have turned to Santa Muerte for protection. Uh, if they succumb to COVID, looking to her for healing. Um, there's even a there's even a votive candle now that's specifically for Santa Muerte coronavirus. So I'll send oh, you the, wow. I'll send you the image after we're done here. And um, and 
I, you mentioned, so in English, her name has two translations. The first is Saint Death, which I like the best because that, that kind of connotes her role as, as a folk saint, which she really is. But the other translation is Holy Death. Right. And, 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 and that's been a really important Christian concept over the centuries of, of you know, hoping to die at a peaceful death surrounded by loved ones in the Christian context, you know, having, you know, made yourself right with the Lord and all of that. And so, you know, Mexico has been a place of terrible bad death in the last 15 years or so. Um, the only country in the past decade that su surpasses Mexico in violent deaths is another country where I have relatives, Syria, which, you know, Syria, had the horrific yeah, civil course. war. Yeah. You know, Mexico in the past decade has had over 200,000 murders, oh, many of them related to the drug war. And so there's a lot of folks um, who yearn for a good or a holy death and, you know, don't want to be gunned down like dogs on a street corner, as many Mexicans unfortunately have over the past decade. And so this whole kind of, you know, if she can at least save you from maybe expiring from COVID, hopefully she can grant you a relatively peaceful death within that context. So, yeah, my impression is that, you know, given the given the circumstances of the pandemic and the economic uh, hardships that it's created for so many working class Mexicans. And of course, um, her devotees are disproportionately working class. Um, yeah, it's my impression that devotion to her is just on the uptick like never before uh, since the pandemic started. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And for the audience, Andrew's talking about, uh, and this is a, a subtlety, but in Spanish, the word Santa can mean saint and holy so therefore it can be saint death and a holy death the noble death the peaceful exactly. death to be with christ or whatever so that's important that's important and uh something i wanted to talk about and uh which is different uh is that when i grew up in uh portugal and mexico uh the idea of death and life are not as separate as they are here in the West, the United States and Europe, or the Mediterranean is different. In other words, the dead are always with us. We're always talking to them. We, we're going to mass every year to cemeteries. In Mexico, my favorite day was up there with Christmas, El Dia de los Muertos. It was yeah, the dead, a magical right? death. So the death and life are more unified and I think uh, not only is this important to know, but when I talk to friends and family in Mexico or, or Portugal, they're not as strained or under stress. Now, I'm, I'm not saying anybody's being foolhardy or, you know, not taking care of their health. I'm saying the attitude of these cultures is much different. And I think it almost helps you during something like this. Americans and Western Europeans are sort of, you know, psychic pain. But these other you think these countries are more stoic about it aren't they yeah yeah no doubt in fact in fact there is a relatively recent movement um in mostly the uk and the us called the deaf positive movement oh wow and it comprises mostly young professional women who work in some facet of the death industry such as uh undertakers um embalmers uh forensic anthropologists and their whole kind of rethinking uh rethinking of death as as kind of a natural part of the life cycle <laughs> really is heavily drawn from how it's always been in mexico right. and actually how it was <laughs> was here in the past as well yeah. and we just got away from that you know kind of protestant culture sanitizing exactly. death and everything but the interesting thing is a lot of the movers and shakers on the in the american death positive movement come out of california more specifically southern california i did my uh doctorate at ucla so i, I lived in in sunny LA for seven years as well, where, where I'm sure, you know, they were exposed to, I mean, Los Angeles is the second largest Mexican city in terms of Mexican population after Mexico city. So you can imagine that they had that Mexican cultural influence in the way that they view death as well. So yeah. Um, 
I've written articles too. I mean, look how look how popular Disney Pixar movie Coco was. You know, the animated version of Day of the Dead. I mean that that grossed almost a billion dollars, <laughs> broke box office records in China, Mexico, the United States, of course. So yeah, um, there is a rethinking, a recalibration um, uh, in in the West, in the industrialized North. And, and a lot of it draws on, on specifically Mexican uh, perspectives on death. Exactly. I was watching a uh, presentation with you and Dr. Kingsbury, and she had this great line that death is pregnant with life. Life can come out of death, and they're one and the same, really, when it comes Yeah, she even that. has a statue of Santa Mu a pregnant Santa Muerte that oh. I think I, I picked up for her in Tepito. Uh, which, which I always kind of cringed at or whatever, but, but I mean, that's, that, that is kind of uh, poignantly symbolic of that. Yeah. It's, it's a, a different attitude that can help us instead of a pretending that death doesn't exist and so forth, that it's a bad thing and just yeah, it's, and, it's part and that's, of life. Exactly. And that's another reason that this whole concept, this old Catholic concept of memento mori, the mm -hmm. Latin phrase, which re, re, which means basically remember death, remember your death, um, has also become kind of in vogue these days. Not only among not only among you know religious Catholics and such, but among um, more secular people who think, okay, if maybe I reflect on a skull or some other skeletal image on a daily image, that's that's going to remind me of my own mortality and uh, and lead me to, uh, you know, make the best of the moment to, to carpe diem, seize the day. Yeah, well said. Or in Tibetan Buddhism, you, you meditate in the graveyards or exactly. Orthodox Judaism, you sleep on the grave of a saint. Or so in Portugal, is... you, you lived in Portugal. Portugal, along with Italy, has the greatest number of um, of death chapels, of chapel, of bone chapels. Yes, of, I visited You know, them. constructed of human bones. <laughs> I've been to all of them. I've been, they're, they're just spectacular. Amazing. Anybody anybody interested in this morbid stuff needs to go to Portugal <laughs> and Italy and check out the beautiful bone chapels like in Evora. Uh, it's just beautiful. Yeah, that's the one I visited. So it's an incredible, it's an incredible experience, life-changing. It is. And those, those were designed exactly for memento mori to reflect on your mortality. In this case, you know, in the Christian sense. So you get yourself right with God because you could go at any time. Well, Andrew, why don't we talk about her origins? And again, I mentioned something about ironic, although it just could be anthropology, but her origin started, uh, as you write, uh, with a pandemic. Oh, oh, well, well, yeah, the origins, the, Black the origins, Death. the origins of the Grim Reaper. Yeah. 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 Well, I, yeah. Mean, I guess her proto, uh, I don't know what to say, seed origins, perhaps. Yeah. The Grim, the European Grim Reaper originates during the uh, Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague um, of the uh, of the 14th century in Europe, which sends approximately one third of Europeans to an early grave. And that's when we have the first kind of skeletal personification of death in Europe, you know, because so many Europeans are, are meeting an early death. Right. Um, interestingly, I, I just, I just read this myself, but it, it wasn't, even though we have this figure of the grim reaper emerging with a scythe and the iconic black robe and everything, it's not till the uh, 1840s when the term Grim Reaper actually is used for the first time in the UK. So oh, wow. the, the term itself is a relatively recent vintage, but the figure, yeah, emerges during the, uh, during the Black Plague. But is this figure, um, does it have an ontology or is it just used for art? That's what I, I mean. Is it uh, a hypostasis of something? That's what I'm trying to say. Or yeah, a symbolic I mean, it, thing? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's both. It's, it's, you know, an artistic rendition, representation of death, but, but you know, also used for didactic purposes by the church, you know, to, to, to represent, uh, to put a more a literal human face, human bony face on death <laughs> uh, for, for doctrinal purposes, right? And then, and then brought over to the Americas um, 
good thing that you talked about the Mediterranean. More often than not, in the Catholic Mediterranean, such as Spain, Portugal, um, parts of France and Italy, death was actually represented as the grim reapress. Uh, in fact, both in Italian and and Spanish, the, the word for the grim reapress is la parca, which literally tra- translates as the parched one, right? Because if you're a skeleton, <laughs> then you're perpetually parched, right? And that's one of the reasons like, one of the major offerings on Santa Muerte altars has to be a glass of water because she does. she's a skeleton. She does so much traveling at night, so she has to hydrate. Um, so, yeah, the Spanish Catholic Church brings over the figure of the Grim Reapers as part of their evangelization of the indigenous people because they have no idea who these indigenous people are or what they might believe, right? And they have no inkling in the beginning that lo and behold, many indigenous groups have their own death deities, right? Um, especially the, the Aztecs and the Mayans. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the Spanish uh, Grim Reapers comes over here. You can imagine that some of the indigenous people see her and immediately make that association with their own death deities, such as the Aztec death goddess, Mixteca Siwatl, who many contemporary devotees, particularly Mexican ones, say Santa Muerte is really the latest incarnation. I shouldn't say incarnation because that literally means someone with a flesh, right? <laughs> she has no <laughs> flesh. Um, is, the, is the latest incarnation of Aztec goddess Mixteca Siwatl. Um, there, there's really, I mean, we don't have any historical evidence that it was specifically Mixteca Siwatl, but nonetheless, what we're seeing is Santa Muerte in Mexico is born of the process of religious syncretism, of this fusion of pre-existing indigenous death deities and the uh, the Spanish Grim Reapers. Um, as far as we know, I have never seen in all of my readings, I've never seen that Europeans actually supplicated or saw the Grim Reaper as a supernatural figure. Um, there's no evidence of that. So, so that was something new, you know, kind of transmogrifying this Spanish Grim Reapers into, into a supernatural figure, more along the lines of pre-existing indigenous death deities. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. And you write her first mention is in what, 1797? 1793, I believe. Oh, yeah, 1793. And it's, it's rich because we get all this information from the annals of the Spanish records of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition in the Americas had its largest office in Mexico City. Why in Mexico City? Well, Mexico City was really the crown jewel of the entire Spanish empire in the Americas. And so the inquisitors hear rumors that out in the present day state of Guanajuato. Have you been there, Miguel? Yeah, I've, I've, and I've seen the momias. <laughs> yeah, right. I just, yeah, I, I saw them recently. I'm into I, that grim stuff, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> right, right, right. The mummies of Guanajuato are definitely bucket list if you make it out to, the, to that beautiful, yeah, yeah. Oh, beautiful gorgeous. city. Um, they get, the inquisitors hear rumors that the Chichimac indigenous people who are out in Guanajuato are worshiping a, a skeletal idol that they call Santa Muerte. And so they ride out from Mexico City and they find out that the rumors actually are true. And they proceed to smash the skeletal idol uh, and castigate the Chichimec indigenous people. And um, that happens again four years later uh, in the neighboring present day state of Querétaro uh, in 1797. And then Santa Muerte basically goes off the Mexican historical record for almost a century and a half. Um, You know, Mexico fights and and attains its independence from Spain uh, in the first decades of the 19th century. 
uh, launches the first great social revolution of the 20th century, the Mexican Revolution, 1910, 1920. Surely uh, Santa Muerte there is there alongside folks, particularly during yeah. the bloody Mexican Revolution, which claims more than a million lives. But we have no historical record of that. She only emerges again in the historical record in the 1940s when um, American anthropologists first start noting her in different parts of Mexico. Yeah, it is bizarre. I mean, like you said, 150 years, she just vanishes. <laughs> yeah. Decides right. to come. Off the, goes off the grid. <laughs> Maybe she went on vacation. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Death on holiday. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And as um, you write, that's a theory that that might have confused or clarified the indigenous people when you were saying uh, Santa Muerte, the priest might have been saying a holy death. And they were like, oh, they're talking about this figure, a real figure. Again, Saint Death instead of holy death. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you can imagine, in the beginning, there's there's much confusion. Um the, the Spanish don't know who the indigenous people are because um, they're not in the Bible. Do they have souls? Likewise, the indigenous people don't know who, <laughs> who the Spanish are riding yeah. on their horses and their, their guns and their sabers. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of confusion. And, and naturally, as the indigenous people are being compelled to convert to Catholicism, you know, they're retaining a lot of their prior belief systems. Yeah, definitely uh, some syncretism going on. And Vance, from your uh, viewpoint or stance, uh, do you have a questions or comments so far about what we've talked about so far? Oh yeah, uh, it's a uh, very it blows my mind actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's one of the things. Yeah, one of the things I was wondering about is do the adherents of uh, San, Santa Morte. Um, how much do they involve themselves with the original traditional Catholic saints and Jesus Christ and all that? Do they mix them together or do they pretty much just turn to Santa Muerte as their main interface to the, you know, the, the uh, supernatural? How does that's that an, work? That's an excellent question. Um, still in Mexico, the majority of Santa Muerte adherents will tell you they're Catholic. Um, but if you inquire further, most of them are more kind of nominal or cultural Catholics who grew up in a Catholic worldview, Catholic environment, but don't necessarily practice institutional Catholicism. They're not going to mass on a regular basis. Maybe they haven't been in a church for years. Um, and there's there's a lot of diversity. Um, you'll hear some folks say, oh, Santa Muerte is super jealous you can only put up a home altar with her alone. She'll get furious at you if you put on any any of the saints or any of the orishas from, from Cuban Santeria. Um, and you'll hear that a lot, but of the hundreds, if not thousands of altars I've seen, most of them are pretty eclectic and most commonly will have other, will have major Catholic saints on them. Most importantly, St. Jude, the patron of lost causes, um, Virgin Guadalupe is popular and increasingly I also he's he's not a Catholic saint but the folk saint the original kind of so-called narco saint Jesus Malverde from the uh, state of Sinaloa as in the Sinaloa cartel um, is often seen also on Santa Muerte altars so despite the fact a lot tell P uh, devotees will tell you she's jealous and she needs a space to her own. That's mostly not what I see on most folks' altars in, in Mexico. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of variety. I mean, if we've got million of, millions of devotees and there is no official church of Santa Muerte, folks are pretty much on their own to kind of do what they want. Do you think, is she always the prominent one in these displays, or does she ever appear as a secondary figure on in, in the uh, panoply there? Yeah, the ones I've always seen, she would always be front and center. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there might be other folks who do that, but yeah, I can't even recall seeing an altar where she's not the prominent one. Yeah, and I think, I think for most devotees, um, she is the primary object of their devotion, not not always necessarily exclusive, but does seem to be the primary object. 
Yeah, interesting. Do you think that overall she would be the shadow side of the authorities? In other words, she, she represents a power that they don't get from their governments or the Catholic Church or whatever, uh, the, you know, uh, because I think that seems to me to be a common element behind their devotion. The um, underdog thing. Um, hmm, that's... That's kind of a difficult question. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I think most folks, most Mexican devotees are, are, are no, no means hostile to the Catholic Church um, and haven't necessarily kind of abandoned it, you know, because of sex abuse scandals and other scandals. Um, I think... I think the most important factor at play, as I argue in my book, is her reputation for being the most efficacious miracle worker on the Mexican landscape. So, I mean, even more important than her, I mean, you know, forget about her whole kind of visage and, and, and personages as death. The most important thing is she has a reputation for being the speediest and most efficacious miracle worker, be it health, wealth, or love. And so in my initial research, I heard from countless folks who would say, hey, you know, I used to be a devotee of, of St. Jude, but, you know, I was, I was asking him for months for this new job, and he never came through. And then my aunt said, oh, why don't you go to the bony lady? That's one of her main um, nicknames, monikers, La Huesuda in Spanish. Why don't you go to the bony lady and, and see if she'll help you out getting a new job? And then they'll say, oh, yeah. And so I did. And within a week of fervent prayers, she got me that new job. And so you hear countless stories about how devotees struck out with, um, with Catholic saints uh, and if you strike out with St. Jude, recalling that he's the patron of lost causes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, you have really that strike three, right? Um, and so that efficacy and the speed of miracles is really the motor that drives her meteoric growth. And they never think they're, they might be engaging in a Faustian bargain where they're getting material things and like their soul is being <laughs> stolen or anything. No, because, uh, you know, most of them don't see her as some dark, um, some dark demon at all. And so, they, I mean, she's, she's just kind of the cycle pomp, the grim reapress, right, who, who comes to get you at the appointed time. So most of them don't, I mean, see her as part of their kind of Catholic folk theology. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong so with the whole Faustian saints. bargain you know, that, that one would do with the devil. Yeah. I, I don't think uh, is operational for most devotees. Yeah. I think you compare her to maybe the archangel, Michael, he's the angel, exactly. of death, but fact, he also can help humans with no, you know, with no strings attached. In fact, right. I, I even mentioned in my book, how, how in many regards she supplants his role for devotees. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And it should be mentioned too. Well, I was going to say she's the Amazon Prime of the gods. She'll give it to you in <laughs> 24 hours if you want. So, but how yeah. much a year do you well, have to pay her though? <laughs> well, you know, it's also interesting that, that if we think about the three giants of the Mexican religious landscape, two are female. Mm. Uh, she, she and Guadalupe. And that's interesting to ponder in a country where we've had, we have an epidemic of femicide, right? Um, and so, on well, my, my, again, my research partner, Dr. Kingsbury, is focusing on the female followers of, of Santa Muerte. And a lot of, a lot of the leaders in, of, of, the, uh, of the cult, and I, I don't say cult in its kind of yeah. traditional derogatory term, sociological term, um, are, 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 are women in Mexico. And so, you know, they're like, they're like spiritual entrepreneurs who never, who never could be priests in the Catholic church, nor in most Protestant churches in Mexico. Yet, you know, the iconic godmother of the, of the cult, um, Enriqueta Romero from Tepito, 
and Enriqueta Vargas, the one who led Santa Muerte International, the one I mentioned before with the, with the gargantuan statue, also female. Areli Vasquez, the New York City pioneer in Queens, uh, transgender female. Um, so, so there's this kind of uh, empowerment, female empowerment that goes on, um, you know, facilitated by a fierce female folk saint. So that's really interesting too in a Mexico where, where, you know, patriarchy and machismo is so bad that, that we have this epic of femicide. I think an average of 10 women are killed by men each day in Mexico. Uh, yeah, that, that is terrible. Uh, and for the audience, just so they're clear, uh, when you mean folk saint, you mean uh, it's something that's not sanctioned by the church. And in fact, to be clear, the Catholic Church sees Santa Muerte as completely satanic. And right. They that's hate a as great... much as the government hates Santa Muerte. <laughs> that's a great clarification, right? We didn't really talk about the definition of folk saint. So the really interesting thing about Mexico and Latin America in general is this is the most Catholic region on earth. 40% of the world's 1.2 billion Catholics are Latin American. Our two largest Catholic populations are Brazil and Mexico. Um, yet, and, and there are almost 10,000 Catholic saints in, in, in the <laughs> faith. Yet, that apparently wasn't enough for many Latin Americans because there's also scores of these so-called folk saints who in most cases were real Brazilians, real Mexicans who lived and died on Mexican and Brazilian soil, often working class folks, often uh, who meet a violent, tragic death. And then within a few years after their death, develop a reputation for being miracle workers. And so folks will gather either at their grave site or the place where they might have been gunned down and ask them for miracles of all kinds of sorts. So there's scores of these folk saints. I named another one, Jesus Malverde from the state of Sinaloa. Um, in, in, in Argentina, there's Gaucho Gil, who is a like Argentine cowboy gaucho. There's actually two other death saints in Latin America. In Argentina, there's San Muerte, who is Santa Muerte's male cousin. And in Guatemala, there's Rey Pascual or King Pascual, who's also a male skeletal saint. So, um, and, and Santa Muerte is different also in the sense that unlike most of these other folk saints uh, who were real people, she at this point is not connected to any real Mexican woman who ever lived. And so that probably grants her a greater um, power because she at this point is viewed as death herself or death itself, death herself, since we're talking about a female death figure, uh, which I would argue gives her greater power than, than most folk saints and Catholic saints. And yes, she has been singled out. Even when Pope Francis went to visit Mexico a few years ago, he, I was wondering, I was there covering it for the media. I was wondering, is he gonna mention her? Is he gonna call her out by name? He didn't, but he referred to her as the, macabre symbol of the oh, narco no. death cults or something. And pretty much on a weekly basis, some priest or, or bishop in Mexico denounces Santa Muerte as satanic. We're going to see it even more now as we approach um, Day of the Dead on November 1 and 1st and 2nd, because a huge trend in Santa Muerte devotion is to be is to incorporate Santa Muerte into Day of the Dead commemorations. And so the church warns against that uh you should not be having truck with santa muerte during days of the dead she's satanic leave her out yeah i think it's a battle they're going to lose myself but uh i'm gonna throw my money's on santa muerte <laughs> well, yeah they are losing it so far no <laughs> yeah doubt. yeah yeah you can't stop these things uh um and uh, yeah going back to vance's question about syncretism you show in your book pictures of a uh, shrine in Houston. Somebody got arrested and they had a Santa Muerte shrine and they have what a statue of Kali. They've got the Buddha. They've got your stereotypical Arab, because I think you mentioned that one of the richest men in Mexico is Syrian back to Syria. Lebanese. So, yeah. Carlos yeah, Lebanese. Uh -huh. Sorry. Sorry. So uh, this idea of syncretism is perfectly okay with Santa Muerte. 
Yeah. And I was surprised. Yeah. That, that photo is from a drug bust. I had a graduate yeah. student who worked for Houston PD and, and, and got me that photo. And I was surprised this was, gosh, this was like in 2010 or 11. And I was surprised to see such eclecticism, you know, cause Houston also has a, Houston has the largest Mexican population uh, in the country after Los Angeles. Right. And, and so if, if LA is kind of the Mecca of American Santa Muerte devotion, Houston is second. Um, and so I, yeah, I was surprised, especially to see Kali there um, back in the day. Not now, <laughs> now she's kind of more common, but yeah, that, that really kind of blew my mind when I first saw that. Yeah. And why don't we talk about some of her, her trappings or, or looks? I mean, she's always, I'm assuming always a skeleton figure and she has a scythe, a scale because she like Osiris, she judges the living and the dead. Is that pretty much and then anything else clothing pregnant um, kind of or uh yeah she has other some other iconic accoutrements such as um you often see her with the hourglass as i mentioned mm -hmm. right uh reminding us that we're running out of time <laughs> right memento <laughs> we're Mori, all right, right? yeah yeah <laughs> she's the timekeeper also uh a very common um accessory is the owl which does double duty um because both in indigenous lore here in the americas and among european um european occult traditions uh the owls is, so, is a harbinger of death there's even a um saying in mexico uh cuando el cuando cante el tecolote el indio muere when the owl screeches, the Indian dies. Um, every Mexican knows that 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 saying. Um, but also, you know, the kind of um, also better known symbolism of Santa, of uh, the owl as a symbol of wisdom. And so she's both wise, all seeing with those piercing um, eyes of the owl, but also, you know, harbinger of death. Also, you you often will see her um, holding a um, planet Earth, a globe, uh, representing her dominion uh, over over the Earth, over the globe. Um, and and one poignant one I remember seeing was a six foot tall um, statue effigy made out of um, pink volcanic rock in my wife's hometown of Morelia. And she has her, she's actually standing on, on the globe and her feet are right in Texas. Wow. <laughs> and that was like so symbolic because most of the arsenal for Mexico's, Mexico's interminable drug war comes from uh, gun shops and um, gun, gun fairs in Texas. Wow. Incredible. And uh, I guess I wanted to ask you about what a Santa Muerte ceremony looks like. And I guess I want to back up to Breaking Bad. There's that amazing scene where you have uh, the two uh, the brothers, the hitmen, narco hitmen. They get out of their hundred thousand dollar Mercedes and they walk out and they see the, you know, the peasants crawling on their stomach. And I remember seeing that scene like, oh, my God, they're going to kill everybody or whatever. But these guys just get on their stomach as humble as the peasants and go devote to Santa Muerte. It was, is there any reality to that scene? Or did, And I uh... wrote about that. I wrote about that in my book because I just happened to be in Houston visiting a friend after I'd moved here to Virginia. When I saw that, I'm like, yes, because I think that was the opening <laughs> scene of maybe season three. I'm like, yes. And then get this. I zoom in on on their license plate of that Mercedes, and it's Michoacan, my wife's oh. home state, right? Oh, so wow. that, yeah. that, that, these were Michoacano sicarios, right? Um, I have never seen devotees. I mean, it was kind of really realistic, but I've never seen devotees crawl on their bellies like that. You know, they're like like they're on the battlefield. I have, however, seen them um, crawl on their knees as you see at Catholic shrines, such as um, maybe you've seen at Fatima. Fatima, they all walk on their also, knees. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes for so, miles, some hundreds exactly, of miles they walk. Yeah. Exactly. So you see that as well, but I've never seen 
folks actually, you know, <laughs> com- completely crawling like in that scene. Um, but yeah, the the uh, shrine they had was pretty accurate, um, accurate as well. Um, there's not, there's a, a lot of the rituals and prayers are all kind of predicated on on Catholicism. In fact, the signature the signature kind of public Santa Muerte worship service is called the Santa Muerte Rosary, and it's basically the same epic prayer. Catholic prayer that's dedicated to the Virgin Mary, um, mostly substituting the name for Mary for Santa Muerte, but not entirely. Mary's Mary's left in there uh, to some extent as well, and that's that's what um, Doña Queta Romero at her um, historic shrine in Tepito does on the first day of every month has a public um, Santa Muerte Rosary service. Um, today they're, they've expanded and they do, they do weddings, they do baptisms. Wow. <laughs> I, I even asked, um, the deceased leader of Santa Muerte Internacional, Enriqueta Vargas, I asked her a few years before her death. I'm like, why are you not doing funerals? And that just seems like the natural yeah, thing yeah. to do. And then a couple <laughs> right, months but... later, she started doing them. So, uh. So yeah, they're they're starting to kind of appropriate a lot of the rites and rituals um, of the Catholic Church as well. But there is no centralized church. These are can we say they're satellites uh, or they're completely separate? Uh, I mean, how does yeah? How does there the is no. Work? I mean, that Santa Muerte Internacional is the largest transnational organization, but the great majority of shrines and altars. Um, uh, in Mexico and the U.S. do not belong to that. But but it is the largest kind of institutional representation. And But again, it's not official because in Mexico, um, in Mexico, you can't legally be recognized uh, as a legal, as a religious association if, uh, if you're worshiping Santa Muerte. Oh, really? So I could start a, an ashram or a mosque and they'd be the government would be fine, but not Santa Muerte? Probably. Yeah. Oh, my God. Probably. And That's again, this terrible. is because of this is because of Catholic political influence. In fact, you know, one of the major political parties in Mexico that you probably know from living down there, the PAN party, the National right. Action mm-hmm. Party, you know, they're they're pretty much the Catholic party. And they were the ones who were actually in power. There was a Santa Muerte church, which was recognized legally in Mexico City, founded in 2003, but then quickly has its legal rep- its legal um, association revoked in 2005, while um, Vicente Fox of the National Action Party president was was president obviously the catholic church uh, pressured him to do that so since 2005 you cannot start a church in santa muerte uh, in mexico that's dedicated to santa muerte i mean you you can you you can but you don't have all the legal uh rights and privileges yeah and the good old tax breaks and all that good stuff terrible <laughs> exactly yeah the tax breaks <laughs> right so ironically there's there's actually more you know religious freedom here in the United States for the cult to expand institutionally than there is in Mexico. No, that makes sense. And and also going back to Vance's question about um, about dealing with the devil, you do offerings like any saint. You can do offerings to a saint to get something back. Uh, tobacco, well, yeah, I mean, alcohol. I mean most. Most devotees approach her uh, on the basis of a contractual relationship or a quid pro quo. So, okay, Santa Muerte, if you heal me of my migraines uh, within the next two weeks, then I will, I will regale your altar with two bottles of top shelf tequila, of Don Julio tequila. <laughs> So if Santa Muerte comes through and heals you, you better damn well yeah. <laughs> provide her with that tequila at the risk of, you know, some kind of um, vengeance taking place. Um, but if she doesn't heal you, you don't have to give her tequila. And that's how most, most devotees 
um, approach Santa Muerte and how most Mexicans approach Catholic saints as well. This kind of contractual uh, quid pro quo relationship. Do they wind up drinking the tequila? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to know. Huh? Like the priests, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of them will claim, you know, when they put it in, in shot glasses and such, that she drinks it and that it has to be replenished. It's like the old joke, you know, uh, you know, I'll give it to you. Whatever you don't drink, I'll have the rest, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Awesome. And of course, yeah, tequila is thought to be one of her favorite tipples because uh, remembering that, you know, she's kind of in some ways quintessentially Mexican. Of course, tequila and mezcal uh, being the quintessential Mexican. Yeah. It's got the dead worm in it, right? That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Santa Muerte, again, for the audience, also is a, is great for healing other things like addiction. You said justice in the the in the legal system, healing, punishment. I think oh, you're right. You know, that, we didn't uh, talk about one of her most important roles, and we can maybe end with this, is as love sorceress, love doctor. And so when I was saying that she resurfaces uh, in the historical record of the 1940s, from the 1940s to the 1980s, the only type of miracles that Mexican and American anthropologists report her working, supposedly working for devotees, is love magic. And mostly for women who believe that their boyfriends or their husbands are cheating on them. And so the oldest known prayer to Santa Muerte is asking Santa Muerte to take out the other woman uh, who their husband is cheating with from their path, and then to take that side and bring the husband back humbled at their feet with <laughs> under the threat that if he ever does it again, Santa Muerte is actually going to lower that side on his neck. <laughs> so um, still today, I mean, the, uh, you know, Santa Muerte has these um, colored votive candles uh, and they each color has a symbol. And the number one selling colored votive candle is the red of love and passion and also for sex magic as well. Uh, so that's a really, really important aspect. Um, in fact, my most popular article on academia.com is exactly her role as love magic. Um, so that's, that's really another really important part and historical part. So she's only doing that, only doing love sorcery from, uh, during mid 20th century. It's not to the light night, late 1980s, where she starts to become more of a multitasker and becomes associated with organized crime and such. Wonderful. And yeah, to end, do you, you have, uh, you have candles and Santa Muerte stuff in your house, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I have. I wish I actually had more because I often travel with only a carry on and, uh, um, you know, it can be problematic to bring back candles and stuff. But, you know, you can buy candles. I, I can buy them locally here in Richmond at, at you know, Latino Marts. Uh, you can get them so easily. So, yeah, I have I'm well, I'm pretty well stocked with with uh, Santa <laughs> Muerte paraphernalia after uh, 12 years of research. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And yes, uh, tell us about uh, the website. And I think what's great about your website is that you offer for people to share experiences and stories on Santa Muerte. Yeah, so gosh, eight or nine years ago, um, my research associate, David Metcalf, and I founded this uh, site called um, SkeletonSaint.com, um, which he and I curated for a number of years recently. Um, uh, my research partner, Dr. Kingsbury, came on board. And yeah, it's the only site of its kind. Uh, we do Santa Muerte news. Um, lately, we've had a lot of testimonials by devotees from all walks of life. Uh, Dr. Kingsbury has been really good about bringing those folks on board and kind of sharing, you know, sharing their own stories of, of how and why they became devotees. Uh, as well it's uh we don't accept any advertising and so uh you know it's it's non-profit and um uh, it's the only side of its kind so yeah we I, I wish you know we had time to to be publishing more but you know both uh both kate and i are also are full-time um classroom instructors as well so 
all kinds of other um, obligations. Yeah, but you're doing great work. And for the audience, uh, his book also has all the magic recipes, even for love and all that. So <laughs> for those of you who might have an errant spouse or you need something, there are the potions and everything in Andrew's book. And what's the name of your website? I'll have it on the show notes, but just for those who are listening in audio. It's um, skeletonsaintoneword.com. To get easy to remember yeah. <laughs> yeah awesome awesome well we are at the end uh vance thanks for keeping us company on this very fascinating journey uh very good hope i didn't pull too many boners and during the show <laughs> uh, no, the pun the book ends bomb, pun. <laughs> have to have our, our bony puns right <laughs> didn't mean to rib you <laughs> <laughs> all right well, well yeah thank, thanks thanks miguel for having me on um very very incisive intelligent questions it always makes these interviews much easier <laughs> when the questions are good so i really appreciate that and the hour has just gone so fast oh no it's been great and i've read your book twice and i highly uh advise the audience to read it because this is a new goddess and it's something exciting it's new and uh it's not going away so yeah yeah let me end by saying this is actually i didn't say it before this is actually the fastest growing new religious movement in the entire west wow. i mean if i estimate there's 12 million this 12 million has occurred in only 20 years only since the cult went public in 2001 so uh you know there is no other new religious movement that has emerged in the last decades that has that kind of growth. Just like new businesses, the great majority of new religious movements fail within years. And so this this one actually is one that has staying power. Well, that's it for the, the holy death. Well, and the angel of death. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for coming on AM Byte. And uh, thanks for your time and good luck with all your research and great work you do. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Miguel and Vance as well. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. Andrew really kills it, no pun intended, with a spanning conversation on the bony one. As mentioned in the intro, this is the full interview because of scheduling issues and a few tech archons on my side. As mentioned too, and as a bonus for AB Prime members, patrons at Patreon, and Red Circle subscribers, I'll include a past interview with Tracy Rollins on her own book on Santa Muerte. As with Andrew, we'll cover the history and theology of the death goddess. Yet Tracy gives us a feminine and devotee angle, as well as a more general conversation on magic, saints, and the death deity in history. As another bonus, I'll include an excerpt with Earl Lee on his book, From the Bodies of the Gods where he argues that there has been a death cult for millennia in Western culture, shamanistic and entheogen using, and how it has shaped most of our civilization. Don't miss the bonuses, and if you find value in any of the content I put out, please support this Red Pill Cafeteria. There are some amazing shows through this season of The Witch and beyond another apocalyptic year. I'll keep it short this post-interview section, but check out the show notes or go to the God Above God Dead Kim for the means to support and become part of a growing Gnostic community. In the meantime, enjoy life and enjoy death, and enjoy this season of the witch with Sofia and Santa Muerte at your side, here and into infinity. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always. <laughs>